everybody and welcome. Tonight I'm going to do a little bit different of a video. It's not going to be about not smoking and, and vaping. Um, because it's Easter, I really wanted to share my faith um, with everyone and talk about what Easter means to me. Because it's not about bunnies and colored eggs and chocolate. Um, it's about forgiveness, redemption, um, and being saved. Um, Jesus loved us, and when he was crucified, when he was put on the cross, um, he made statements that really attest to his love for us. And that's what I wanted to share. This is my current Bible study that I'm doing. And I'd really like to take the time and I would ask that you, you know, listen. Um, and share. Share your thoughts on it, too. Um, but Jesus had made seven statements from the cross. And they all reflect his love for us. So I'd kind of like to, you know, kind of go through it. Um, as quickly as I can, and just kind of touch on some bases um, on it. So, first, I want to take a second to just pray and just to thank God for, you know, being there for us, for saving us. Uh, I'm going to ask God that the words that I speak be His words and not my own. Um, God, we give you the glory, the honor, and we thank you for being the head of our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, you know, in the first statement, um, it comes out of Luke, um, chapter 23, verse 24. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, this is a statement, and it's basically a prayer from, from Jesus to the Father, asking him to forgive them. Um, so we can take assurance in uh, that prayer, that our sin is completely forgiven. Have you ever said to yourself, I don't feel forgiven, um, I don't, you know, how could he forgive me, or I don't feel it? Well, to be honest, feelings, they don't have anything to do with forgiveness. Forgiveness has everything to do with the promises of God. It's God who said that when we come to him and we confess, he'll forgive us. And that settles it. Some of us might even think, how can he forgive after all that I have done? You know, and the whole truth of the matter is, if he can forgive the cold-hearted Roman soldiers that nailed him to the cross, the crowds that mocked him, and the priesthood of Caiaphas, who could say that God cannot forgive me? I mean, you're talking these people, okay? They arrested him. They tried him. They beat him. They made him carry a cross. And here he was on the cross asking his father to forgive them. So forgiveness is something that he promised us. He said if we confess and accept him, that he would forgive us. You know, another part of this prayer um, that can assure us, that we can be assured of, is that the cycle of hatred, of sin, it ends on the cross, okay? Jesus, while he was suspended on that cross between heaven and earth, okay, he bore all of our sin, all the hatred, the viciousness, the anger, it was kind of as if this God had said to us, if you want to know where all that ends, it ends there, worn by the cross. You know, another thing that we should learn from that statement is that the Lord did practice what he preached. You know, had he cursed those who were crucifying him, mocked him, all of what he had taught, would have meant nothing in the three years of his ministry, okay? He practiced. He, he taught forgiveness. 
And when he was on that cross, when those others would have been cursing at the crucifiers, at them soldiers and yelling at them, calling them names, he asked for forgiveness for them. You know, we all need to, to, to learn forgiveness because we have to let things go. Um, because when we when we choose not to forgive someone, we're giving Satan power for our life. Um, that gives Satan like the key. He's got control of it, you know. So we have to learn how to forgive. Forgiveness is a decision of will. If we choose to forgive when we're not really feeling it, and we really, you know, like, why would I want to forgive you? You betrayed me. We're we're letting Satan win, okay? But if we forgive, even when we don't want to, our emotions, our feelings, they'll eventually follow, okay? But we have to make a willful decision to forgive. When we do, the power of the cross sets us free. What Jesus did on the cross was the beginning of what he has been doing for over 2,000 years. He has continuously forgiven everyone who has come to him and asked for forgiveness. That's amazing. Okay. The second statement that he made came out of Luke in 23, um, and it was verses 29 to 43. And I'm going to read it. It said, And one of the male factors, which was hanged, railed on him, saying, If you are Christ, save yourself and us. But the other one, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? Seeing thou art in the same condemnation as we are, and we indeed are justly, for we are receiving the due rewards for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into your kingdom. And Jesus had said to him, Verily I say unto you, Today shall you be with me in paradise. Okay, now, to explain this statement a little bit. Jesus was crucified between two criminals. And they both had different reactions to him. Jesus was in the center, and there were two other crosses, or one on either side of him, with two criminals on them. Okay, both of these criminals were dying. Okay, they were suffering acute physical pain. They were both sinners. They were in need of forgiveness, but yet one of them died in his sin, and he ended up in eternal judgment. The other died forgiven and justified, and he went to paradise. Both had really been re reviling Jesus. You know, when, they, when the Roman soldiers were nailing Jesus to the cross, okay, they were both reviling him. They were, you know, mocking him, okay? But something happened to the second one. He heard Jesus' first statement from Luke 23 and 34, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Those who are being crucified often curse the crucifier. They didn't forgive him. Those words must have transformed that criminal from a doubter to a believer, praise God. Okay? And... If you think about it, the world today is much like Golgotha then, okay? There's two types of people in this world. There are those who reject Jesus, and then there are those who welcome him. And what God is saying is that as you reflect on, you know, these two statements from the cross, is, is your heart changing from doubt to belief? You know, Jesus offers forgiveness to all because of what happened on the cross. Do you receive that forgiveness? Believers are walking in forgiveness. Perhaps, you know, there is someone that you need to extend forgiveness to today. You know, um, that's something to think about. Think about, you know, on the cross. That second criminal heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
and it changed him and it turned him okay now in statement the third statement that was made um, was basically somebody returning to Jesus okay um, near the cross stood Mary his mother his mother's sister Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene and Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby now in order for this next for this statement to make sense we need to go back a little bit to Matthew in chapter 26. In Matthew 26 and 30, it says, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out in the Mount of Olives. Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written that I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. And by the time we get to Matthew 26 and 56, he says, But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all of the disciples forsook him and fled, including John. Um, little John, the beloved, the one who felt the closest to Jesus. Um, they had all, all 12 disciples had fled by this time, okay? But by the time of the trial of Jesus, okay, John had returned, and he was the only disciple who did, okay? Peter was off wallowing in his sorrow over his denial of Jesus. Thomas was off, you know, covered in a blanket of doubt, and Judas was out there taking his own life for his betrayal of Jesus. Yet... John alone came to the cross, okay? Now we need to go to another statement, um, John 19 and 25, okay? Now this is still the third statement, um, but I want to read this one from John 19 and 25. Now they are stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by, whom he loved, okay, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her unto his own home. Okay, now John, <laughs> um, for those of us who know, you know have read um, his writings, John always referred to himself as the disciple who was the closest to Jesus, whom Jesus loved. So do you ask yourself, did Jesus have favorites? No, Jesus did not have favorites. John was close because he wanted to be close to Jesus, okay? And any of us can be as close as we want, also. Okay? Um, it says in James 4 and 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Jesus did not. Okay. Um, let me step back a second. The disciples had all fled. Jesus got arrested. They all fled. Um, they all went off on their own doing their own thing. Um, he was tried. He was flogged. He was beaten. John came back. Okay, the other disciples still had not come back. Um, John was there. Okay. So now here's Jesus, and he's on the cross, and he's looking down, and he sees his mother, and he sees John. Well, he turned around. And he had said, Behold thy son, and behold thy mother. To John. He didn't sit there and question John. He didn't say to him, Where you been? Yo, bro, I thought you had my back. I just went through all this, and you haven't been here. Here I am, nailed to this cross. Where have you been? He never questioned him. He never rebuked him. 
You know, he didn't tell him of all the disciples, you're the one I love. He never said that to John. But he looked at John and he gave him the highest responsibility that our dying Savior could give anyone. He said, Behold thy mother. He wanted John to substitute for him. He wanted John to stand up for and speak for him. Now, we all make promises to the Lord, and sometimes we don't keep them. We promise we're going to spend time with him. We promise we're going to get into his word. You know, we promise we're going to go to church. Um, but sometimes, you know, life just gets to us. You know, circumstances, things are happening, going on, and we don't get in there and read the Bible as much as we should. We don't get into the word. We don't speak to him. We don't pray enough. We don't. We don't hold our end of the bargain. Okay, and we just give up. Well, we know that we can be glad and we can be thankful that we can repent. We can return to him and we can receive his loving care and direction because he is a forgiving God. Now we're going to move on to the next statement, which is statement number four. Okay, and that's found in Matthew 27 and 46. And it's about the ninth hour. Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. This is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's do that again. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. This is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That statement. That is the very essence of faith. It is like the core of our redemption. If you miss this, you miss everything. If God had not turned his back on the sun, and he had not abandoned him at that moment, we could never be sure that the Son actually carried our sin and our judgment on the cross. Okay? Did you get that? If God hadn't turned his back on the Son, if he had not abandoned him at that moment, we would never be sure that Jesus actually carried our sin and our judgment on the cross. <sighs> it's probably one of the most confusing statements made from the cross. Forsaking literally means to leave someone, to abandon them completely. Done. Well, you sit there and go, well, how can a father abandon his son who coexisted with him in perfect unity for eternity? Why would he abandon him now? Well, why? It was for you and me. It was for our redemption, our forgiveness, so that we could live forever. The question still remains, why the father deserted the son in his most desperate moment? because of our sin. Jesus carried our judgment, our sin upon that cross. Therefore, God turns his back. See, God can see sin. Um, if you go back to Adam and Eve, the first son, when they ate from the fruit, God turned his back on them. He cast them out of the garden. They weren't allowed in the garden anymore, and they had to go. They caused sin to enter into mankind, and when Jesus came to the, the world, it was so that he could see sin, because God could not see it, and God would not forgive it. And, you know, all through the Old Testament, how many times did God curse the Israelites and turn his back on them, and then they'd come for forgiveness again, and he would turn his back on them? Um, God just could not deal with sin, so Jesus 
was our reconciliation, and that's what the cross was about, the reconciliation um, of man to God. Um, he carried our judgment and our sins upon the cross, okay? Um, it wasn't Jesus' imagination that the Father forsook him, as some people will teach. Um, at that moment of separation, the sin of humanity reigned on Jesus' holy sinless body. For the first time since before eternity, Jesus looked up into heaven, and he saw his Father as a judge. He didn't call him Abba, he called him Eli, my God. He saw God, the Sovereign, God, the Judge, God, the Awesome, Filled One. The Bible tells us from cover to cover that Jesus took upon himself the judgment of everyone who would follow him, everyone who would obey him. You know, Jesus died in darkness so that we could live in light. He died in silence so that we may forever have a word from the Lord. He died forsaken so that we could be accepted, and he died rejected so that we could be received. <laughs> how miraculous, how wonderful, how awesome is that? He died rejected by the Father so that we could be received. Take some time and just reflect on the sacrifice that Christ made for our salvation. Okay? Whew. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In statement five, we go to John 19 and 28. It says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture that might be fulfilled said, I thirst. He said, I am thirsty. Wow. I am thirsty. This was a cry of personal agony. Physical pain. But it was also a cry of deep spiritual need. Now, Let's talk about this for a minute. Two days prior to the crucifixion, there was a lot of tension and apprehension going on. First, you had Jesus up in the upper room where he told his disciples that one of them would betray him. And then that was followed by Gethsemane, where he was sweating blood he was asking his father, is there some other way, father, that this cup could pass for me? Okay. Then he got arrested. He got dragged back and forth from one place of interrogation to another. A total of six times. Okay. He was flogged. He was beaten. He was forced to carry that heavy wooden cross to Calvary before he got hung on that cross with the nails, tearing his hands and his feet. No wonder his soul was so anguished with that cry of physical thirst. It was his thirst that assures us that he will never, never turn down anyone who comes to him crying, Lord, save me. If you ever doubt that he hears you cry, remember his cry. From the cross and be assured that he will always hear you. Remember, he will always keep his promises. He will never go back on them. The words that I'm thirsty, they should be assuring everyone that our peace treaty with God was signed by the blood of Jesus and nobody can take that away from you, not even you. Okay, our Lord was experiencing physical thirst, but he was also experiencing a spiritual thirst. After being separated from the Father by the sin of us, by mankind, he was thirsting for his Father's presence. When was the last time you thirsted? 
forgot. I'm going to move on to statement number six because in statement number six that he said from the cross <clears throat> comes from Luke 23 and 46. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. He cried with a loud voice, Father, I commit my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. It's profound in its simplicity because it indicates a willingness to just deposit the most precious thing, the most prized possession in the safest deposit place of all the Father's hands. The word commit in this verse means to go, to leave something somewhere, and to walk away from it, knowing with all certainty, with trust, that when you go back, it will be there. Okay? If we go to Matthew 17 and 22 for a second, it says, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he will be raised again. Okay? Well, they flogged him. They hammered nails through his flesh. They crowned him with thorns, and for twelve hours he had been subjected to the worst that human hands could do to a man. He was ready. He wanted to be deposited into the hands of the Father, the greatest hands of all. He was about to be in paradise. Okay? To be in the hands of the Father meant that for... <laughs> that meant on the third day, he would rise from the grave. Okay? That for 40 days he would walk with his disciples, he would talk with them, instruct them, and commission them. Then on the 40th day, the disciples would see him when the Mount of Olives rise up to heaven. He was ready. At that point when he gave up the ghost, when he said, Father, I commit my spirit to you, he was done. Okay? Statement 7 that was made, okay, was only recorded by John. Remember, John was the only disciple who was there. All the other disciples write, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all write about the crucifixion. But only John was there. He lived it. Okay, and in John 19 and 29, John put, Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar. Remember, the other statement before was, I am thirsty. Okay. Um, so, now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar, and they put it upon hyssop and put it in his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. So yes, you are hearing that he died twice. He only died once. But as the story was told to others, Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, in Luke, Luke ended the crucifixion with him giving up the ghost after he committed his spirit to God. But in John, John said, he said it was finished, and then he died. Um, another way of saying it is finished, and what Jesus had actually said, was tetelestai. It took three English words to say that one word, tetelestai. It is the perfect 
passive verb mean that the purpose has been fulfilled. It means that the goal has been realized. It means that it is finished. It also indicates that the fulfilled purpose continues forever. It means that the impact of the benefits that were accomplished on the cross will go on until Jesus comes back. When Jesus said it is finished, it meant that in every generation, every nation, anyone who comes to him and bows at his feet and receives and accepts him will be eternally saved. What effect does the finished work of Christ have on you today? Think about it. I'd kind of like to end this with just a saying that I've heard in the past and something that I like to think about and when people question you know faith or question God I kind of like to ask them this question and have them think about it um, and, the, and it goes like this would you rather live your life believing that God exists and die and find out he doesn't. Or live your life like he doesn't exist and die and find out he does. So the question is, where do you want to spend eternity? So over this Easter holiday, let us remember what Jesus did for us and let us thank him and reflect on it and reflect on what it I love you all. God bless. And thank you for taking the time to listen.